Hello, everyone. Welcome in to Storytime with Moog. I am Moog, and today we are continuing on with The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo, starting with part one, book the third, chapter six. The first. But let us descend. All right, let's do it. Um, okay, so what happened last time? Last time we started with um, the people on the boat, and... Um, they are taking water in their ship, and they can't do anything to stop it. They can't plug it up. They can't, like, pump it. Their pump is broken, all of these things. And so they are throwing things overboard to try and lighten the load a little bit so that they sink ever so slower, I guess, to maybe try and figure something out. But they can't. And so what they do is they decide to throw the heaviest thing overboard, which is their guilt and their their burden. So there's this piece of paper written out, which we don't know what it says. I'm hoping that in the future we do find out. And they all sign it. And they put it in a flask, they seal the flask, and they toss it overboard. And then they're all like on their knees praying, and the water is just rising, so they're already like kneeling in the water. And then it does sink. So. And then we flip back to the child who they left on this island, Portland. So the child is walking, trying to find some sort of shelter, food, anything to like help them survive this super, super cold January night. And they come across some tracks, tracks that have been made by um, a woman. And so um, the child follows the tracks and hears like some sobbing, some like moaning type noises. It digs in the snow, finds a dead woman, digs a little bit further because he's still hearing the noise, and finds a child. And scoops the child up. The child is super, super cold, um, pretty much unresponsive. Scoops the child up, takes off his coat, wraps the kid up in the coat, and then starts walking again, um, hoping towards town. Um, they do get to a town, and at the very entrance of the town, there's two different houses on each side, and he tries both of them. One is like a mansion, the other one not so well off. Neither one of them have responses. Nobody's waking up, nobody's even moving. Um, and so we continue through the town, we go to the city center, and knocking on doors, everything, nobody is answering. And we do get a little um, context here from uh, Victor Hugo saying, like, at this time, a lot of people were w wary of strangers because of a plague that had swept through. So that could be why, but also, like, it's three in the morning and you're getting a knock at your door. Could also be why, regardless if it is, like, a child, like, a lot of people just wouldn't be up for that. Um... But we're walking through and we come across a van. And who should be in this van but Ursus? The same person that we met in, like, before part one. The person who is, like, bordering, being, you know, on the good side of the law and the bad side of the law. And Ursus is a hoot and a half. Um, maybe two hoots. <laughs> but Ursus welcomes both of them in, um warms them, feeds them, um, gives them water, milk, all of these things, lays out a big bear, the bear skin, like folds them up so that they can go to sleep. And the whole time that this is happening, Ursus is complaining, <laughs> complaining and like just calling them like a thief and like all of these like fish names and things like that. And like being a boa constrictor and just stealing all of these things from him, but still feeding them the last of his food and things like that. So Ursus is kind of amazing right now. But where we left off, um, the child and the other child, we don't have names for either of them, um, are just wrapped up and sleeping, and Ursus is going out. Ursus did ask a bunch of questions of the child, um, like, what's your name? Uh, where's your parents? Where are you from? That sort of thing. And he's unable to really answer those questions like he doesn't have any relations he doesn't know where he's from he doesn't know where he is now like all of these things no this isn't my sister i found this girl in the snow her mom was like over here so that's where we left off all right so we are at part one 
book the third, chapter six. So let's go ahead and get started. We are 26% of the way through. Making our way. Making our way downtown. Let's do it. The Awaking. The beginning of the day is sinister. A sad, pale light penetrated the hut. It was the frozen dawn, that wane light which throws into relief the mournful reality of objects which are blurred into spectral forms by the night, did not awake the children, so soundly were they sleeping. The caravan was warm. Their breathings alternated like two peaceful waves. There was no longer a hurricane without. The light of dawn was slowly taking possession of the horizon. The constellations were being extinguished, like candles blown out one after the other. Only a few large stars resisted. The deep-toned song of the infinite was coming from the sea. The fire in the stove was not quite out. The twilight broke, little by little, into daylight. The boy slept less heavily than the girl. At length, a ray brighter than the others broke through the pane, and he opened his eyes. The sleep of childhood ends in forgetfulness. He lay in a state of semi-stupor, without knowing where he was or what was near him, without making an effort to remember, gazing at the ceiling, and setting himself an aimless task as he gazed dreamily at the letters of the inscription, Ursus Philosopher, which, being unable to read, he examined without the power of deciphering. The sound of the key turning in the lock caused him to turn his head. The door turned on its hinges. The steps were let down. Ursus was returning. He ascended the steps, his extinguished lantern in his hand. At the same time, the pattering of four paws fell upon the steps. It was Homo, following Ursus, who had always returned to his home. The boy awoke with somewhat of a start. The wolf, having probably an appetite, gave him a morning yawn, showing two rows of very white teeth. He stopped when he had got halfway up the steps, and placed both forepaws within the caravan, leaning on the threshold like a preacher with his elbows on the edge of the pulpit. He sniffed the chest from afar, not being in the habit of finding it occupied as it was then. His wolf-like form, framed by the doorway, was designed in black against the light of the morning. He made up his mind and entered. The boy, seeing the wolf in the caravan, got out of the bearskin and, standing up, placed himself in front of the little infant, who was sleeping more soundly than ever. Ursus had just hung the lantern up on a nail in the ceiling. Silently, and with mechanical deliberation, he unbuckled the belt in which was his case and replaced it on the shelf. He looked at nothing and seemed to see nothing. His eyes were glassy. Something was moving him deeply in his mind. His thoughts at length found breath, as usual, in a rapid outflow of words. He exclaimed, Happy, doubtless, dead, stone dead. He bent down and put a shovelful of turf mold into the stove, and as he poked the peat, he growled out, I had a deal of trouble to find her. The mischief of the unknown had buried her within two feet of snow. Had it not been for Homo, who sees as clearly with his nose as Christopher Columbus did with his mind, I should be still there, scratching at the avalanche and playing hide-and-seek with death. Diogenes took his lantern and sought for a man. I took my lantern and sought for a woman. He found a sarcasm, and I found mourning. How cold she was. I touched her hand. A stone. What silence in her eyes. How can any one be such a fool as to die and leave a child behind? It will not be convenient to pack three into this box. A pretty family I have now, a boy and a girl. Whilst Ursus was speaking, Homo sidled up close to the stove. The hand of the sleeping infant was hanging down between the stove and the chest. The wolf set to licking it. He licked it so softly that he did not wake the little infant. Ursus turned round. 
Well done, Homo. I shall be father, and you shall be uncle. Then he betook himself again to arranging the fire with philosophical care, without interrupting his aside. Adoption. It is settled. Homo is willing. He drew himself up. I should like to know who is responsible for that woman's death. Is it man, or— He raised his eyes, but looked beyond the ceiling, and his lips murmured. Is it thou? Then his brow dropped, as if under a burden, and he continued. The knight took the trouble to kill the woman. Raising his eyes, they met those of the boy, just awakened, who was listening. Ursus addressed him abruptly. What are you laughing about? The boy answered. I'm not laughing. Ursus felt a kind of shock, looked at him fixedly for a few minutes and said, Then you are frightful. The interior of the caravan on the previous night had been so dark that Ursus had not yet seen the boy's face. The broad daylight revealed it. He placed the palms of his hands on the two shoulders of the boy and, examining his countenance more and more piercingly, exclaimed, Do not laugh any more. I am not laughing, said the child. Ursus was seized with a shudder from head to foot. You do laugh, I tell you. Then, seizing the child with a grasp, which would have been one of fury had it not been one of pity, he asked him roughly, Who did that to you? The child replied, I do not know what you mean. How long have you had that laugh? I have always been thus, said the child. Ursus turned towards the chest, saying in a low voice, I thought that work was out of date. He took from the top of it, very softly, so as not to awaken the infant, the book which he had placed there for a pillow. Let us see conquest, he murmured. It was a bundle of paper in folio, bound in soft parchment. He turned the pages with his thumb, stopped at a certain one, opened the book wide on the stove, and read, De Dinastes, 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 there we go, De Dinastes, here it is. And he continued, Bucafissa usque ad ares genesivis denudatis nasoque murdridato masca eris et ridibi semper. There it is, for certain. Then he replaced the book on one of the shelves and growled, It might not be wholesome to inquire too deeply into a case of the kind. We will remain on the surface. Laugh away, my boy. Just then the little girl awoke. Her good day was a cry. Come, nurse, give her the breast, said Ursus. The infant sat up. Ursus, taking the vial, the vial from the stove, gave it to her to suck. Then the sun rose. He was level with the horizon. His red rays gleamed through the glass and struck against the face of the infant, which was turned towards him. Her eyeballs, fixed on the sun, reflected his purple orbit like two mirrors. The eyeballs were immovable. The eyelids also. See, said Ursus, she is blind. End of part one. Okay, so. Our answer has been answered. Our question has been answered. So our, the child, who we still don't know in the name, has already been disfigured by the Comprachicos, which means that the deed and the burden that they carried was mutilating this kid. At least one of the burdens that they were carrying. We don't know. Maybe there was a whole host of kids that they mutilated. But they disfigured him to have a smiling face. And the little girl that um, the child found is blind. Which, maybe, that's probably the best pairing. Because she won't have, like, the 
like the instant fear that people will, would have, like how people uh, greeted Frankenstein's monster just by appearance and being terrified of him. Um, she won't have that instant fear. She would only like grow to know him for him, which is great. I love that. But that's where we are. And it is something that Ursus has heard of and has thought that it was an old practice that doesn't happen anymore, which is interesting as well. All right. Part two. Book the first. The everlasting presence of the past. Man reflects man. Chapter one. Lord Clan Charlie. One. There was, in those days, an old tradition. The tradition was Lord Linnaeus Clancharlie. Linnaeus Baron Clancharlie, a contemporary of Cromwell, was one of the peers of England, few in number, be it said, who accepted the Republic. The reason of his acceptance of it might, indeed, for want of a better, be found in the fact that for the time being, the Republic was triumphant. It was a matter, of course, that, Char that Lord Clan Charlie should adhere to the Republic as long as the Republic had the upper hand. But after the close of the Revolution and the fall of the par parliamentary government, Lord Clan Charlie had persisted in his fidelity to it. It would have been easy for the noble patrician to re enter the reconstituted upper house repentance being ever well received on restorations, and Charles the Second, being a kind prince enough to those who returned to their allegiance to him. But Lord Clan Charlie had failed to understand what was due to events. While the nation overwhelmed with acclamation, the king come to retake possession of England, while unanimity was recording its verdict while the people were bowing their salutation to the monarchy, while the dynasty was rising anew amidst a glorious and triumphant recantation. At the moment when the past was becoming the future and the future becoming the past, that nobleman remained refractory. He turned his head away from all that joy and voluntarily exiled himself. While he could have been a peer, he preferred being an outlaw. Years had thus passed away. He had grown old in his fidelity to the end republic, to the dead republic, and was therefore crowned with the ridicule which is the natural reward of such folly. He had retired into Switzerland and dwelt in a sort of lofty ruin on the banks of the Lake of Geneva. He had chosen his dwelling in the most rugged nook of the lake, between Chilean, where it where is the dungeon of Bonnevard, and Vivet, where is Ludlow's tum tomb? The rugged Alps, filled with twilight, winds, and clouds, were around him, and he lived there, hidden in the great shadows that fall from the mountains. He was rarely met by any passerby. The man was out of his country, almost out of his century. At that time, to those who understood and were posted in the affairs of the period, no resistance to establish things was justified. England was happy. A restoration is as the reconciliation of husband and wife, prince and nation return to each other. No state can be more graceful or more pleasant. Great Britain beamed with joy. To have a king at all was a good deal, but furthermore, the king was a charming one. Charles the Second was amiable, a man of pleasure, yet able to govern, and great, if not after the fashion of Louis the Seventh, the Seventeenth, the Fourteenth. He was essentially a gentleman. Charles the Second was admired by his subjects. He had made war in Hanover for reasons best known to himself. At least, no one else knew them. He had sold Dunkirk to France, a maneuver of state policy. The Whig peers, concerning whom Chamberlain says, 
the cursed republic, infected with its stinking breath, several of the high nobility had had the good sense to bow to the inevitable, to conform to the times, and to resume their seats in the House of Lords. To do so, it sufficed that they should take the oath of allegiance to the king. When these facts were considered, the glorious reign, the excellent king, august princes given back to divine mercy to the people's love, when it was remembered that persons of such consideration as Monk and, later on, Jeffreys, had rallied round the throne, that they had been properly rewarded for their loyalty and zeal by the most splendid appointments and the most lucrative offices, that Lord Clancharlie could not be ignorant of this, and that it only depended on himself to be seated by their side, glorious in his honours, that England had, thanks to her king, risen again to the summit of prosperity, that England was all banquets and carousals, that everybody was rich and enthusiastic, that the court was gallant, happy, and magnificent. If by chance, far from these splendors, in some melancholy indescribable, half-light, like nightfall, that old man, clad in the same garb as the common people, was observed pale, absent-minded, bent towards the grave, standing on the shore of the lake, scarce heeding the storm and the winter, walking as though at random, his eye fixed, his white hair tossed by the wind of the shadow, silent, pensive, solitary. Who could forbear to smile? It was the sketch of a madman. Thinking of Lord Clancharlie, of what he might have been and what he was, a smile was indulgent. Some laughed out loud, others could not restrain their anger. It is easy to understand that men of sense were much shocked by the insolence implied by his isolation. One extenuating circumstance. Lord Clancharlie had never had any brains. Every, everyone agreed on that point. 2. It is disagreeable to see one's fellows practice obstinacy. Imitations of Regulus are not popular, and public opinion holds them in some derision. Stubborn people are like reproaches, and we have a right to laugh at them. Besides, to sum up, are these perversities, these rugged notches, virtues? Is there not in these excessive advertisements of self-abnegation and of honor a good deal of ostent ostentation? It is all parade more than anything else, by such exaggeration of solitude and exile, to carry nothing to extremes is the wise man's maxim. Be in opposition if you choose, blame if you will, but decently, and crying out all the while, long live the king. The true virtue is common sense. What falls ought to fall. What succeeds ought to succeed. Providence acts advisedly. It crowns him who deserves the crown. Do you pretend to know better than Providence? When matters are settled, when one rule has replaced another, when success is the scale in which truth and falsehood are weighed, in one side the catastrophe, in the other the triumph, then doubt is no longer possible. The honest man rallies to the winning side, and although it may happen to serve his fortune and his family, he does not allow himself to be influenced by that consideration, but thinking only of the public wheel, holds out his hand heartily to the conqueror. What would become of the state if no one consented to serve it? Would not everything come to a standstill? To keep his place is the duty of a good citizen. Learn to sacrifice your secret preferences. Appointments must be filled, and someone must necessarily sacrifice himself. To be faithful to public function functions is true fidelity. The retirement of public officials would paralyze the state. What? Banish yourself. 
how weak, as an example, what vanity, as a defiance, what audacity. What do you set yourself up to be, I wonder? Learn that we are just as good as you. If we choose, we too could be intractable and untamable and do worse things than you. But we prefer to be sensible people, because I am Trimalcian. You think that I could not be a Cato. What nonsense. Three. Never was a situation more clearly defined or more decisive than that of 1660. Never had a course of conduct been more plainly indicated to a well-ordered mind. England was out of Cromwell's grasp. Under the Republic, many irregularities had been committed. British preponderance had been creative, created. With the aid of the Thirty Years' War, Germany had been overcome. With the aid of the Fronde, France had been humiliated. With the aid of the Duke of Braganza, the power of Spain had been lessened. Cromwell had tamed Mazarin. In signing treaties, the protector of England wrote his name above that of the King of France. The United Provinces had been put under a fine of eight millions. Algiers and Tunis had been attacked. Jamaica conquered. Lisbon humbled. French rivalry encouraged in Barcelona and Massanelio in Naples. Portugal had been made fast in England. The seas had been swept of Barbary pirates from Gibraltar to Crete. Maritime domination had been founded under two forms, victory and commerce. On the 10th of August, 1653, the man of 33 victories, the old admiral who called himself the sailor's grandfather, Martin Happertz von Tromp, had been, had, who had beaten the Spanish, had been destroyed by the English fleet. The Atlantic had been cleared of the Spanish navy, the Pacific of the Dutch, the Mediterranean of the Venetian, and by the patent of navigation, England had taken possession of the sea coasts of the world. By the ocean, she commanded the world. At sea, the Dutch flag humbly saluted the British flag. France, in the person of the ambassador Manc Mancini, bent the knee to Oliver Cromwell, and Cromwell played with Calais and Dunkirk as with two shuttlecocks on a battle door. The continent had been taught to tremble. Peace had been dictated. War declared. The British ensign raised on every pinnacle. By itself the protector's regiment of Ironsides weighed in the fears of Europe against an army. Cromwell used to say, I wish the Republic of England to be respected, as was respected the Republic of Rome. No longer were delusions held sacred. Speech was free. The press was free. In the public street, men said what they listed. They printed what they pleased without control or censorship. The equilibrium of thrones had been destroyed. The whole order of European monarchy, in which the Stuarts formed a link, had been overturned. But at last, England had emerged from this odious thing, order of things, and had won its pardon. The indulgent Charles II had granted the Declaration of Breda. He had conceded to England oblivion of the period in which the son of Huntingdon Brewer placed his foot on the neck of Louis the Fourteenth. England said its mea culpa and breathed again. The cup of joy was, as we have just said, full. Gibbets for the regicides adding to the universal delight. A restoration is a smile. But a few gibbets are not out of place, and satisfaction is due to the conscience of the public. To be good subjects was, thenceforth, the people's sole ambition. The spirit of lawlessness had been expelled. Royalty was reconstituted. Men had recovered from the follies of politics. They mocked at revolution. They jeered at the republic. And as to those times when such strange words as right 
liberty, progress, had been in the mouth, why they laughed at such bombast. Admirable was the return to common sense. England had been in a dream. What joy to be quit of such errors. Was ever anything so mad? Where should we be if every one had his rights? Fancy everyone's having a hand in the government. Can you imagine a city ruled by its citizens? Why, if the citizens are the team, and the team cannot be driver, to put to the vote is to throw to the winds. Would you have states driven like clouds? Disorder cannot build up order. With chaos for an architect, the edifice would be a babel. And besides, what tyranny is this pretended liberty? As for me, I wish to enjoy myself, not to govern. It is a bore to have to vote. I want to dance. A prince is a providence and takes care of us all. Truly, the king is generous to take so much trouble for our sakes. Besides, he is to the manner born. He knows what it is. It's his business. Peace. War. Legislation. Finance. What have the people to do with such things? Of course, the people have to pay. Of course, the people have to serve. But that should suffice them. They have a place in policy. From them come two essential things, the army and the budget. To be liable to contribute and to be liable to serve, is that not enough? What more should they want? They are the military and the financial arm, a magnificent role. The king reigns for them, and they must reward him accordingly. Taxation and the civil list are the salaries paid by the peoples and earned by the prince. The people give their blood and their money in return for which they are led. To wish to lead themselves. What an absurd idea. They require a guide. Being ignorant, they are blind. Has not the blind man his dog? Only the people have a lion, the king, who consents to act the dog. How kind of him. But why are the people ignorant? Because it is good for them. Ignorance is the guardian of virtue. Where there is no perspective, there is no ambition. The ignorant man is in useful darkness, which, suppressing sight, suppresses covetousness. Whence innocence. He who reads thinks, who thinks reasons. But not to reason is duty and happiness as well. These truths are incontestable. Society is based on them. Thus had sound social doctrines been re-established in England. Thus had the nation be re been reinstated. At the same time, a correct taste in literature was reviving. Shakespeare was despised. Dryden admired. Dryden is the greatest poet of England, and of the century said Atterbury, the translator of Akatophel. It was about the time when M. Hute, Bishop of Avranches, wrote to Saumaise, who had done the author of Paradise Lost, the honor to refute and abuse him. How can you trouble yourself about so mean a thing as that Milton? Everything was falling into its proper place. Dryden above, Shakespeare below, Charles II on the throne, Cromwell on the gibbet. England was rising herself out of the shame and the excesses of the past. It is a great happiness for nations to be led back to monarchy, to good order in the state, and good taste in letters. That such benefits should be misunderstood is difficult to believe. To turn the cold shoulder to Charles II, to reward with ingratitude the magnanimity which he displayed in ascending the throne, was not such conduct abominable? Lord Linnaeus Clancharlie had inflicted this vexation upon honest men. To sulk at his country's happiness, alack, what aberration! 
we know that in 1650 parliament had drawn up this form of declaration i promise to remain faithful to the republic without king sovereign or lord under pretext of having taken this monstrous oath lord clancharlie was living out of the kingdom and in the face of the general joy thought that he had the right to be said he had a morose esteem for that which was no more and was absurdly attached to things which had been to excuse himself was impossible the kindest-hearted man abandoned him his friends had long done him the honour to believe that he had entered the republican ranks only to observe the more closely the flaws in the republican armour and to smite it the more surely when the day should come for the sacred cause of the king these lurkings in ambush for the convenient hour to strike the enemy a death blow in the back are attributes to loyalty such a line of conduct had been expected of lord clancharlie so strong was the wish to judge him favourably but in the face of his strange persistence in republicanism people were obliged to lower their esteem evidently lord clancharlie was confirmed in his convictions that is to say an idiot the explanation given by the indulgent wavered between peril stubbornness and senile obstinacy the severe and the just went further they blighted the name of the renegade folly has its rights but it has also its limits a man may be a brute but he has no right to be a rebel and after all what was this lord clan charlie a deserter he had fled his camp the aristocracy for that of the enemy the people this faithful man was a traitor it is true that he was a traitor to the stronger and the faithful to the weaker it is true that the camp repudiated by him was the conquering camp and the camp adopted by him the conquered it is true that by his treason he lost everything his political privileges and his domestic hearth his title and his country he gained nothing but ridicule ridicule he attained no benefit but exile but what does all this prove that he was a fool granted plainly a dupe and traitor in one let a man be as great a fool as he likes so that he does not set a bad example fools need only be civil and in consideration thereof they may aim at being the basis of monarchies the narrowness of clan charlie's mind was incomprehensible his eyes were still dazzled by the phantasmagoria of the revolution he had allowed himself to be taken in by the republic yes and cast out he was an affront to his country the attitude he assumed was downright felony absence was an insult he held aloof from the public joy as from the plague in his voluntary banishment he found some indescribable refuge from the national rejoining he treated loyalty like a contagion over the widespread gladness of the revival of the monarchy denounced by him as a lazaretto he was the black flag what could he look thus askance at order recon reconstituted a nation exalted and a religion restored over such serenity why cast his shadow take umbrage at england's contentment must he be the one blot in the clear blue sky be as a threat protest against a nation's will refuse his yes to the universal consent it would be disgusting if it were not the part of a fool clan charlie could not have taken into account the fact that it did not matter if one had taken the wrong turn with cromwell as long as one found one's way back into the right path with monk take monk's case he commands the republican army charles the second having been informed of his honesty writes to him monk who combines virtue with tact dissimulates at first 
then suddenly at the top of his troops dissolves the rebel parliament and re-establishes the king on the throne monk is created duke of albemarle has the honor of having saved society becomes very rich sheds a glory over his own time is created knight of the garter and has the spro the prospect of being buried in westminster abbey such glory is the reward of british fidelity lord clancharlie could never rise to a sense of duty thus carried out he had the infatuation and obstinacy of an exile he contented himself with hollow phrases he was tongue-tied by pride the words conscience and dignity are but words after all one must penetrate to the depths these depths lord clancharlie had not reached his eye was single and before committing an act he wished to observe it so closely as to be able to judge it by more senses than one hence arose absurd disgust to the facts examined no man can be a statesman who gives way to such overstrained delicacy excess of conscientiousness degenerates into infirmity scruple is one-handed when a spectre is to be seized and eunuch when fortune is to be wedded distrust scruples they drag you too far unreasonable fidelity is like a ladder leading into a cavern one step down another then another and there you are in the dark the clever reascend fools remain in it conscience must not be allowed to practice such austerity if it be it will fall until from tra transition to transition it at length reaches the deep gloom of political prudery then one is lost thus it was with lord clancharlie principles terminate in a precipice he was walking his hands behind him along the shores on the lake of geneva a fine way of getting on in london they sometimes spoke of the exile he was accused before the tribunal of public opinion they pleaded for and against him the cause having been heard he was acquitted on the ground of stupidity many zealots many zealous friends of the former republic had given their adherence to the stuarts for this they deserve praise they naturally calumniated him a little the obstinate are repulsive to the compliant men of sense in favor and good places at court wary of his disagreeable attitude took pleasure in saying if he has not rallied to the throne it is because he has not been sufficiently paid etc he wanted the chancellorship which the king has given to hide one of his old friends went so far as to whisper to him he told me so himself remote as was the solitude of linnaeus clancharlie something of this talk would reach him through the outlaws he met such as old regicides like andrew broughton who lived at Lausanne. clan charlie confined himself to an imperceptible shrug of the shoulders a sign of profound deterioration on one occasion he added to the shrug these few words murmured in a low voice i pity those who believe such things all right so what's going on right now we're talking about this one dude who has self-exiled himself and we're also getting a better picture of the um sort of like push and pull of monarchy versus like giving people power and a say um and also saying that people are stupid and they don't know like what they want and why would they ever want to do that and blah 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 and ignorance is bliss and why why should we have them reading books when they could just not be reading books and not thinking for themselves and we could just do whatever we say is okay for them so yeah that's sort of what's happening right now <laughs> but a lot more detailed and a lot more um elegant 
elegantly, eloquently, elegantly and eloquently said than what I just did. Victor Hugo, damn good writer. All right. Part four of the first chapter. <laughs> Charles II, good man, despised him. The happiness of England under Charles II was more than happiness. It was enchantment. A restoration is like an old oil painting, blackened by time and revarnished. All the past reappeared. Good old manners returned. Beautiful women re reigned and governed. Evelyn notices it. We read in his journal. Luxury, profaneness, contempt of God. I saw the king on Sunday evening with his courtesans, Portsmouth, Cleveland, Mazarin, and two or three others, all nearly naked in the gaming room. We feel that there is ill nature in this description, for Evelyn was a grumbling Puritan, tainted with Republican reveries. He did not appreciate the profitable example given by kings in those grand Babylonian gaieties, which, after all, maintain luxury. He did not understand the utility of vice. Here is a maxim. Do not extirpate vice if you want to have charming women. If you do, you are an idiot. You are like idiots who destroy the chrysalis whilst they delight in the butterfly. Charles II, as we have said, scarcely remembered that a rebel called Clan Charlie existed. But James II was more heedful. Charles II governed gently, it was his way, we may add, that he did not govern the worse on that account. The sailor sometimes makes on a rope intended to baffle the wind, a slack knot which he leaves to the wind to tighten. Such is the stupidity of the storm and of the people. The slack knot very soon becomes a tight one. So did the government of Charles II. Under James II, the throttling began. A necessary throttling of what remained of the revolution. James II had a laudable ambition to be an efficient king. The reign of Charles II was, in his opinion, but a sketch of restoration. James wished for a still more complete return to order. He had, in 1660, deplored that they had confined themselves to the hanging of ten regicides. He was a more genuine reconstructor of authority. He infused vigor into serious principles. He installed true justice, which is superior to sentimental declamations, and attends, above all things, to the interests of society. In, this, in his protecting severities, we recognize the father of the state. He entrusted the hand of justice to Jeffreys, and its sword to Kirk. That useful colonel, one day, hung and rehung the same man, a Republican, asking him each time, Will you renounce the Republic. The villain, having each time said no, was dispatched. I hanged him four times, said Kirk with satisfaction. The renewal of executions is a great sign of power in the, execu in the executive authority. Lady Lyle, who, though she had sent her son to fight against Monmouth, had concealed two rebels in her house was executed. Another rebel, having been honorable enough to declare that an Anabaptist female had given him shelter, was pardoned, and the woman was burned alive. Kirk, on another occasion, gave a town to understand that he knew its principles to be Republican by hanging nineteen Burgesses. These reprisals were certainly legitimate, for it must be remembered that, under Cromwell, they cut off the noses and ears of the stone saints in the churches. James II, who had had the sense to choose Jeffreys and Kirk, was a prince imbued with true religion. He practiced mortification 
in the ugliness of his mistresses. He listened to Le Père de Colombier, a preacher almost as unctuous as Le Père Caminet, but with more fire, who had the glory of being, during the first part of his life, the counselor of James the Second, and during the latter, the inspirer of Mary Alcock. It was, thanks to this strong religious nourishment, that, later on, James the Second was enabled to bear exile with dignity, and to exhibit, in his retirement at St. Germain, the spectacle of a king rising superior in adversity, calmly touching for king's evil and conversing with Jesuits. It will be readily understood that such a king would trouble himself to a certain extent about such a rebel as Lord Linnaeus Clancharlie. Hereditary peerages have a certain hold on the future, and it was evident that if any precautions were necessary with regard to that lord, James II was not the man to hesitate. End of chapter one. Okay. So, we're getting into the political weeds now. So, in, like, before we started part one, when we were with Ursus, in Ursus's van is, like, a whole list of members of the aristocracy. Their names, what their duke or lord or whatever of, and a little bit about, like, the castle, the palace that they live in. And it feels like we're getting that again, but instead of list form, it's more fleshed out, more detail is being provided. And I'm sure that this is going to be important later. However, there's a lot of names <laughs> being thrown about in here and a lot of uh, information and so trying to, like, filter out what is important and what isn't is a little, I mean, we'll figure it out, I guess. We'll, we'll find out. We'll find out. I shouldn't be speaking too hastily. So, all right. Also, I think it's interesting that um, Victor Hugo is writing about somebody who sort of um, self- self uh what am i trying to say excommunicated themselves because uh victor hugo was uh banished from from his home <laughs> from from his country because of his two previous books and he is still very pointed in his commentary so i can see why the government would feel threatened cuz how dare he say things that are revealing of what society actually is and how dare people actually read it. <laughs> All right. Chapter two, Lord David Deary Moore. One, Lord Lina Linnaeus Clan Charlie had not always been old and prescribed. He had had his phase of youth and passion. We know from Harrison and Pride that Cromwell, when young, loved women and pleasure, a taste which, at times, another reading of the text, woman, betrays a sedition, a seditious man. Distrust the loosely clasped girdle. Male proesincactum, juvenem cavete. Lord Clancharlie, like Cromwell, had had his wild hours and his irregularities. He was known to have had a natural child, a son. This son was born in England in the last days of the Republic, just as his father was going into exile. Hence, he had never seen his father. His bastard, this bastard of Lord Clancharlie, had grown up as page at the court of Charles II. He was styled Lord David Deary Moore. He was a lord by courtesy, his mother being a woman of quality. The mother, while Lord Clancharlie was becoming an owl in Switzerland, made up her mind, being a beauty, 
to give over sulking and was forgiven that goth, her first lover, by one undeniably polished and at the same time a royalist, for it was the king himself. She had been but a short time the mistress of Charles the Second, sufficiently long, however, to have made his majesty, who was delighted to have won so pretty a woman from the Republic, bestow on the little Lord David, the son of his conquest, the office of keeper of the stick, which made the bastard, that bastard officer boarded at the king's expense by a natural revulsion of feeling, an ardent adherent to the stewards. Lord David was for some time one of the hundred and seventy wearing the great sword, while afterwards entering the corps of pen pensioners, there we go, he became one of the forty who bear the gilded hall halberd. He had, besides being one of the noble company instituted by Henry the Eighth as a bodyguard, the privilege of lying of laying on of laying the dishes on the king's table. Thus it was that whilst his father was growing grey in exile, Lord David prospered under Charles the Second. After which he prospered under James the Second. The king is dead. Long live the king. It is the non deficit altar aureus. It was on the ascension of the Duke of York that he obtained permission to call himself Lord David Deary Moore from an estate which his mother, who had just died, had left him in that great forest of Scotland, where he found the crag, a bird which scoops out a nest with its beak in the trunk of the oak. 2. James the Second was a king, and affected to be a general. He loved to surround himself with young officers. He showed himself frequently in public on horseback, in a helmet and cuirass, with a huge projecting wig hanging below the helmet and over the cuirass, a sort of equestrian statue of imbecile war. He took a fancy to the graceful mane of the young Lord David. He liked the royalist for being the son of a Republican. The repudi the repudiation of a father does not damage the foundation of a court fortune. The king made Lord David gentleman of the bedchamber, at a salary of a thousand a year. It was a fine promotion. A gentleman of the bedchamber sleeps near the king every night, on a bed which is made up for him. There are twelve gentlemen who relieve each other. Lord David, whilst he held that post, was also head of the king's granary, giving out corn for the horses, and receiving a salary of two hundred sixty pounds. Under him were the five coachmen of the king, the five postilions of the king, the five grooms of the king, the twelve footmen of the king, and the four chair-bearers of the king. He had the management of the race horses, which the king kept at Newmarket, and which cost his majesty six hundred pounds a year. He worked his will on the king's wardrobe, from which the knights of the garter are furnished with their robes of ceremony. He was saluted to the ground by the usher of the black rod, which belongs to the king. That usher, under James the Second, was the knight of Dupa. Mr. Baker, who was clerk of the crown, and Mr. Brown, who was clerk of the parliament, could to Lord David. The court of England, which is magnificent, as a model of hospitality. Lord David presided as one of the twelve at banquets and receptions. He had the glory of standing behind the king on offertory days, when the king had given to the church the golden Byzantium, Byzantium, on collar days, when the king wears the collar of his order, on communion days, when one takes the sacrament, accepting the king and the princess. Princes, not princess. Just making things up over here. It was he who, 
on Holy Thursday, introduced into his majesty's presence the twelve poor men to whom the king gives as many silver pences as the years of his age, and as many shillings as the years of his reign. The duty devolved on him when the king was ill, to call to the assistance of his majesty the two grooms of the almonry, who are priests, and to prevent the approach of doctors without permission from the council of state. Besides, he was lieutenant colonel of the Scotch regiment of guards, the one who plays the Scottish march. As such, he made several campaigns, and with glory, for he was a gallant soldier. He was a brave lord, well-made, handsome, generous, and majestic in look and in manner. His person was like his quality. He was tall in stature as well as high in birth. Excuse me. At one time, he stood a chance of being made groom of the stole, which would have given him the privilege of putting the king's shirt on his majesty. But to hold that office, it was necessary to be either prince or peer. Now, to create a peer is a serious thing. It is to create a peerage, and that makes many people jealous. It is a favor, a favor which gives the king one friend and a hundred enemies, without taking into account that the one friend becomes ungrateful. James the Second, from policy, was indisposed to create peerage, peerages, but he transferred them freely. The transfer of a peerage produces no sensation. It is simply the continuation of a name. The order is little affected by it. The goodwill of ro royalty had no objection to raise Lord David Beerymore to the upper house so long as it could do so by means of a substituted peerage. Nothing would have pleased his majesty better than to transform Lord David Beerymore, lord by courtesy, into a lord by right. Three. The opportunity occurred. One day it was announced that several things had happened to the old exile, Lord Clan Charlie, the most important of which was that he was dead. Death does just as much good to folks. It causes a little talk about them. People related what they knew, or what they thought they knew, of the last years of Lord Linnaeus. What they said was probably legend and conjecture. If these random tales were to be credited, Lord Clan Charlie must have had his republicanism intensified towards the end of his life, to the extent of marrying strange obstinacy of the exile, Anne Bradshaw, the daughter of the regicide. They were precise about the name. She had also died, it was said, but in giving birth to a boy. If these details should prove to be correct, his child would, of course, be the legitimate and rightful heir of Lord Clan Charlie. These reports, however, were extremely vague in form, and were rumors rather than facts. Circumstances which happened in Switzerland in those days were as remote from the England of that period as those which take place in China from the England of today. Lord Clan Charlie must have been fifty-nine at the time of his marriage, they said, and sixty at the birth of his son, and must have died shortly after, leaving his infant orphaned both of father and mother. This was possible, perhaps, but improbable. They added that the child was beautiful as the day, just as we read in all the fairy tales. King James put an end to these rumors, evidently without foundation, by declaring, One fine morning, Lord David Deary Moore, sole and positive heir in default of legitimate issue, and by his royal pleasure of Lord Linnaeus Clan Charlie, his natural father, and the absence of all other issue and descent being established. Patents of which Grant were registered in the House of Lords. 
By these patents, the king instituted Lord David Dury Moore in the titles, rights, and prerogatives of the late Lord Linnaeus Clan Charlie, on the sole condition that Lord David should wed when he attained a marriageable age, a girl who was, at that time, a mere infant, a few months old, and whom the king had, in her cradle, created a duchess. No one knew exactly why, or, rather, everyone knew why. This little infant was called Duchess Hosiana, Josiana, something like that. The English fashion then ran on Spanish names. Okay, so then it is like, a, like an age. Okay, Hosiana, got it. The English fashion then ran on Spanish names. One of Charles II's bastards was called Carlos, Earl of Plymouth. It is likely that Hosiana was a contraction for Josefa y Anna. Hosiana, however, may have been a name, the feminine of Hosius, one of Henry VIII's gentlemen, was called Hosias du Passage. It was to this little duchess that the king granted the peerage of Clan Charlie. She was a peeress till there should be a peer. The peer should be her husband. The peerage was founded on a double castle word, the barony of Clan Charlie and the barony of Hunkerville. Besides, the barons of Clan Charlie were in recompense of an ancient feat of arms and by royal license marquis of Carleone in Sicily. Okay, so what's happening so far? So I don't know how long this chapter is going to be, so I feel like we need to take a little a little breather. Um so our lord clan Charlie who has banished himself out of the country and just sort of like left all of his responsibilities and things it has been rumored that while he was in switzerland he got married and he had a kid which means he has an heir and so to prevent his heir from being the heir and ruling um we have established that david lord david deary more is going to take his place he's going to in in title in responsibilities in like all of these things like he is going to be the one to take the clan charlie stuffs because rumors haven't been proven correct like accurate like none of those things have actual proof so i feel like we're scared and we don't want this little baby to come in and like rule and I think that's what's going on. It's just it's just another way to keep control and influence control. Basically. Peers of England cannot bear foreign titles. They are, nevertheless, exceptions. Thus, Henry Arundel, Baron Arundel of Wardour, was, as well as Lord Clifford, a count of the Holy Roman Empire, of which Lord Cowper is a prince. The Duke of Hamilton is Duke of Chattel Herald in France. Basil Fielding, Earl of Denbigh, is Count of Habsburg of Laufenburg and of Rheinfelden in Germany. The Duke of Marlborough was Prince of Mendelheim in Saubia just as the Duke of Wellington was Prince of Waterloo in Belgium. The same Lord Wellington was a Spanish Duke of Ciudad Rodrigo and Portuguese Count of Vimeria. There were in England, and there are still, lands both no noble and common. The lands of Lord of Clan Charlie were all noble. These lands, burgs, bailwicks, fiefs, rents, freeholds, and domains adherent to the peerage of Clan Charlie Hunkerville belonged provisionally to Lady Hosiana, and the kings declared that, once married to Hosiana, Lord David Deary Moore should be Baron Clan Charlie. Besides the Clan Charlie inheritance, Lady Hosiana had her own fortune. She possessed great wealth, 
much of which was derived from the gifts of Madame Sans K to the Duke of York, Madame Sans K, in short, for Madame. Henrietta of England, Duchess of Orleans, the lady of highest rank in France after the Queen, was thus called. 4. Having prospered under Charles and James, Lord David prospered under William. His Jacobite feeling did not reach to the extent of following James into exile. While he continued to love his legitimate king, he had the good sense to serve the usurper. He was, moreover, although sometimes disposed to rebel, rebel against discipline, an excellent officer. He passed from the land to the sea forces and distinguished himself in the white squadron. He rose in it to be what was then called captain of a light frigate. Altogether, he made a very fine fellow, carrying to a great extent the elegancies of vice, a bit of a poet, like everyone else, a good servant of the state, a good servant to the prince, assiduous at feasts, at galas, at ladies' receptions, at ceremonies, and in battle, servile in gentlemanlike way, very haughty, with eyesight dull or keen, according to the object examined, inclined to integrity, obs obsequious or arrogant, as occasion required, frank and sincere on first acquaintance, with power of assuming the mask afterwards, very observant of the smiles and frowns of the royal humor, careless before his words, point, always ready to risk his life on a sign from his majesty with heroism and complacency, capable of any insult but of no impoliteness, a man of courtesy and etiquette, proud of kneeling at great regal ceremonies, of a happy valor, a courtier on the surface, a paladin below, quite young at forty-five. Lord David sang French songs, an elegant gaiety which had delighted Charles the Second. He loved eloquence and fine language. He greatly admired those celebrated discourses, which are called the funeral orations of Bossuet. From his mother, he had inherited almost enough to live on, about ten thousand pounds a year. He managed to get on with it by running into debt. Oh, in magnificence, extravagance, and novelty, he was without a rival. Directly he was copied. He changed his fashion. On horseback he wore loose boots of cowhide, which turned over with spurs. He had hats like nobody else's, unheard of lace and bands of which he alone had the pattern. End of chapter two. Okay, so now the next chapter we're talking about somebody else. So, so far in this part, part two, book one, we are just getting a better picture of the aristocracy in this one particular sect. And next is Duchess of Hosiana. So, I am curious to see how these different players are going to be woven into the story. I'm curious. I also wonder if the kid, the um, Clan Charlie kid, I'm wondering if that kid is our child and he is actually supposed to be like, a lord. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so my theory. It is the child. He's supposed to be ruling. We don't want this. We're terrified of this because we can't predict, we can't like make him do things. So we decide to find the child, mutilate the child. And then voila. That's what I'm thinking is going to happen. Or that's what I'm thinking like this is leading to. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. 
I don't know. I have not read this book, so this is just a complete guess. And I don't want to know the answer if you've read it. Find you. <laughs> no spoilers. Chapter 3. The Duchess of Hosiana. Towards 1705, although Lady Hosiana was 23 and Lord David 45, 44, the wedding had not yet taken place. And that for the best reasons in the world. Did they hate each other? Far from it. But what cannot escape from you inspires you with no haste to obtain it. Hosiana wanted to remain free, David to remain young. To have no tie until as late as possible appeared to him to be a prolongation of youth. Middle-aged young men abounded in those rakish times. They grew gray as young fops. The wig was an accomplice. Later on, powder became the auxiliary, 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 there we go. At fifty-five, Lord Charles Gerard, Baron Gerard of the Gerards of Bl Bromley, filled London with his successes. The young and pretty Duchess of Buckingham, Countess of Coventry, made a fool of herself for love of the handsome Thomas Bellasis, Viscount Valkenburg, who was sixty-seven. People quoted the famous verses of Corneille, the Septuagerian, to a girl of twenty, Marquise Simon Visser. Women, too, had their success in the autumn of life. Witness Nin Ninen and Marion, such were the models of the day. Hosiana and David carried on a flirtation of a particular shade. They did not love. They pleased each other. To be at each other's side sufficed them. Why hasten the conclusion? The novels of those days carried lovers and engaged couples to that kind of stage which was the most becoming. Besides, Hosiana, while she knew herself to be a bastard, felt herself a princess and carried her authority over him with a high tone in all their arrangements. She had a fancy for Lord David. Lord David was handsome, but that was over and above the bargain. She considered him to be fashionable. To be fashionable is everything. Caliban, fashionable and magnificent, would distance Ariel for. Lord David was handsome, so much the better. The danger in being handsome is being insipid and that he was not. He bedded, boxed, ran into debt. Hosiana thought great things of his horses, his dogs, his losses at play, his mistresses. Lord David, on his side, bowed down before the fascinations of the Duchess Hosiana, a maiden without spot or scruple, haughty, inaccessible, and audacious. He addressed sonnets to her, which Hosiana sometimes read, in these sonnets, he declared that to possess Hosiana would be to rise to the stars, which did not prevent his always putting the ascent off to the following year. He waited in the antechamber outside Hosiana's heart, and this suited the convenience for both. At court, all admired the great taste of this delay. Lady Hosiana said, It is a bore that I should be obliged to marry Lord David. I who would desire nothing better than to be in love with him. Hosiana was the flesh. Nothing could be more resplendent. She was very tall, too tall. Her hair was of that tinge which might be called red gold. She was plump, fresh, strong and rosy, with immense boldness and wit. She had eyes which were too intelligible. She had neither lovers nor chastity. She walled herself round with pride. Men, oh fee, oh, a god only would be worthy of her. Or a monster. If virtue consists in the protection of an inaccessible portion, Hosiana possessed all possible virtue, but without any innocence. She disdained intrigues, but she would not have been displeased had she been supposed to have engaged in some provided that the objects were uncommon and proportioned to the merits of one so highly placed. 
she thought herself she thought little of her reputation but much of her glory to appear yielding and to be unapproachable is perfection oceana felt herself majestic and material hers was a cumbrous beauty she usurped rather than charm she trod upon hearts she was earthly she would have been as much astonished as being proved to have a soul in her bosom as wings on her back she discur she discoursed on Locke. she was polite she was suspected of knowing arabic to be the flesh and to be a woman are two different things where a woman is vulnerable on the side of pity for instance which so readily turns to love hosiana was not not that she was unfeeling the ancient comparison of flesh to marble is absolutely false the beauty of flesh consists in not being marble its beauty is to palpitate to tremble to blush to bleed to have firmness without hardness to be white without being cold to have its sensations and its infirmities its beauty is to be life and marble is death flesh when it attains a certain degree of beauty has almost a claim to the right of nudity it conceals itself in its own dazzling charms as in a veil he who might have looked upon hosiana nude would have perceived her outlines only through a surrounding glory she would have shown herself without hesitation to a satyr or a eunuch she had the self-possession of a goddess to have made her nudity a torment ever eluding a pursuing tantalus would have been an amusement to her the king had made her a duchess and jupiter a nerid a double irradiation of which the strange brightness of this creature was composed in admiring her you felt yourself becoming a pagan and a lackey her origin had been dastardly and as what her origin had been dastardly and the ocean she appeared to have emerged from the foam from the stream had risen the first jet of her destiny but the spring was royal in her there was something of the wave of chance of the patrician and of the tempest she was well read and accomplished never had a passion approached her yet she had sounded them all she had a disgust for realizations and at the same time a taste for them she had stabbed herself it would like lucretia not have been until afterwards she was a virgin stained with every defilement in its visionary stage she was a possible astart in a real diana she was in the insolence of high birth tempting and inaccessible nevertheless she might find it amusing to plan a fall for herself she dwelt in a halo of glory half wishing to descend from it and half feeling curious to know what a fall was like she was a little too heavy for her cloud to err is a diversion princely unconstraint has the privilege of experiment and what is frailty in a plebeian is only frolic in a duchess Hosiana was in everything, in birth, in beauty, in irony, in brilliancy, almost a queen. She had felt a moment's enthusiasm for Louis de Beaufils, who used to break horseshoes between his fingers. She regretted that Hercules was dead. She lived in some undefined expectation of a voluptuous and supreme ideal. Morally, Hosiana brought to one's mind the line, Un beau torse de femme, une hydre se termine. Hers was a noble neck, a splendid bosom, having harmoniously over a royal heart, a glance full of life and light, a, con a countenance pure and haughty, and who knows? Below the surface was there not in a semi-transparent and misty depth in undulating supernatural prolongation perchance deformed and dragon-like a proud virtue ending in vice in the depth of dreams two 
with all that, she was a prude. It was the fashion. Remember Elizabeth. Elizabeth was a type that prevailed in England for three centuries, the 16th, 17th, and 18th. Elizabeth was more than English. She was Angelican. Hence the deep respect of the Episcopalian Church for that queen, respect resented by the Church of Rome, which counterbalanced it with a dash of excommunication. In the month of Sixtus V, when anathematizing, anathematizing, there we go, Elizabeth, malediction turned to madrigal. Mary Stuart, less concerned with the church and more with the woman part of the question, had little respect for her sister Elizabeth, and wrote to her as queen to queen and coquette to prude. Your disinclination to marriage arises from your not wishing to lose the liberty of being made love to. Mary Stuart played with the fan, Elizabeth with the axe. An uneven match. They were rivals, besides, in literature. Mary Stuart composed French verses. Elizabeth translated Horace. The ugly Elizabeth decreed herself beautiful, like quatrains and acrostics, acrostics. Had the keys of towns presented to her by cupids, bit her lips after the Italian fashion, rolled her eyes after the Spanish, and in her wardrobe three thousand dresses and costumes, of which several were for the character of Minerva and Amphitrite, esteemed the Irish for the width of their shoulders, covered her farthingale with braids and spangles, loved roses, cursed, cursed swore and stamped, struck her maids of honor with her clenched fists, used to send Dudley to the dead devil, beat Burley, the chancellor, who would cry, poor old fool, spat on Matthew, collared Hatton, boxed the ears of Essex, Essex showed her legs to Bassompierre, and was a virgin. What she did for Bassompierre, the queen of Sheba had done for Solomon. Cons consequently, she was right, holy writ having created the precedent, that which is biblical may well be angelican. Angelican. Biblical precedent goes so far as to speak of a child who was called Ednehaquim or Melilichat, that is to say, the wise man's son. Why object to such manners? Cynicism is at least as good as hypocrisy. Nowadays England, whose Loyola is named Wesley, casts down her eyes a little at the remembrance of that past age. She is vexed at the memory, yet proud of it. These fine ladies, moreover, knew Latin. From the sixteenth century this had been accounted a feminine accomplishment. Lady Jane Grey had carried fashion to the point of knowing Hebrew. The Duchess Hosiana Latinized. Then, another fine thing, she was secretly a Catholic, after the manner of her uncle, Charles II, rather than her father, James II. James II had lost his crown for his Catholicism, and Hosiana did not care to risk her peerage. Thus it was that while a Catholic amongst her intimate friends, and the refined of both sexes, she was outwardly a Protestant for the benefit of the riffraff. This is the pleasant view to take of religion. You enjoy all the good things belonging to the official Episcopalian church, and later on you die, like Rhodius, in the odor of Catholicity, having the glory of a mass being said for you by Le Père. Pito. Although plump and healthy, Hosiana was, we repeat, a perfect prude. At times her sleepy and voluptuous way of dragging out the end of her phrases was like the creeping of a tiger's paw in the jungle. The advantage of prudes is that they disorganize the human race, they deprive it of the honor of their adherence. Beyond all, keep the human species at a distance. This is a point of the greatest importance. 
When one has not got Olympus, one must take the Hotel de Rem Remboyer. Juno resolves herself into Araminta. A pretension to divinity not admitted creates affectation. In default of thunderclaps, there is impertinence. The temple shrivels into the Bordeaux. Not having the power to be a goddess, she is an idol. There is, besides imprudery, a certain pedantry which is pleasing to women. The coquette and the pen pedant are neighbors. Their kinship is visible in the fop. The subtile is derived from the sensual. Gluttony affects delicacy. A grimace of disgust conceals cupidity. And then woman feels her weak point guarded by all that casuistry of gallantry which takes the place of scruples and prudence. It is a line of circumvallation with a ditch. Every prude puts on an air of repugnance. It is a protection. She will consent, but she disdains for the present. Hosiana had an uneasy conscience. She felt such a leaning towards immodesty that she was a prude. The recoils of pride in the direction opposed to our vices lead us to those of a contrary nature. It was the excessive effort to be chaste which made her a prude. To be too much on the defensive points to a secret desire for attack. The shy woman is not straight-laced. She shut herself up in the arrogance of the exceptional circumstances of her rank, meditating, perhaps, all the while, from sudden lapse from it. It was the dawn of the 18th century. England was a sketch of what France was during the Regency. Walpole and Du Bois are not unlike. Marlborough was fighting against his former king, James II, to whom it was said he had sold his sister, Miss Churchill. Bolingbroke was in his meridian, and Richelieu in his dawn. Gallantry found its convenience in a certain medley of ranks. Men were equalized by the same vices as they were later on, perhaps by the same ideas. Degradation of rank, an aristocratic prelude, began what the revolution was to complete. It was not very far off the time when Gelouet was seen publicly sitting in broad daylight on the bed of the Marquise de Pinay. It is true, for manners re-echo each other, that in the sixteenth century, Spenton's nightcap had been found under Anne Boylan's pillow. If the word woman signifies fault, as I forget what counsel decided, never was woman so womanlike as then. Never, covering her frailty by her charms and her weaknesses by her omnipotence, has she claimed absolution more imperio imperiously. In making the forbidden the permitted fruit, Eve fell. In making the permitted the forbidden fruit, she triumphs. That is the climax. In the 18th century, the wife bolts out her husband. She shuts herself up in Eden with Satan. Adam is left outside. End of part two. Part three. Crisscrossing. There we go. All Hosiana's instincts impelled her to yield herself gallantly rather than to give herself legally. To surrender on the score of gallantry implies learning, recalls Melanchus and Amaryllis, and is almost a literary act. Mademoiselle de Sundry, putting aside the attraction of ugliness for ugliness's sake, had no other motive for yielding to Pelsian. The maiden, a, the maiden a sovereign, the wife a subject, such was the old English notion. Hosiana was deferring the hour of this subjection as long as she could. She must eventually marry Lord David, since such was the royal pleasure. It was a necessity, doubtless. But what a pity. 
Hosiana appreciated Lord David and showed him off. There was between them a tacit agreement, neither to conclude nor to break off the engagement. They eluded each other. This method of making love one step in advance and two back is expressed in the dances of the period, the minute and the gavotte. It is unbecoming to be married, fades one's ribbons and makes one look old. An espousal is a dreamy absorption of brilliancy. A woman handed over to you by a notary. How commonplace. The brutality of marriage creates definite situations, suppresses the will, kills choice, has a syntax like grammar, replaces inspiration by orthon orthography, makes a dictation of love, disperses all life's mysteries, diminishes the rights both of sovereign and subject, by a turn of the scale destroys the charming equilibrium of the sexes, the one robust, robust in bodily strength, the other all-powerful in feminine weakness, strength on one side, beauty on the other, makes one a master and the other a servant, while without marriage one is a slave, the other a queen. To make love prosaically decent, how gross. To deprive it of all impropriety, how dull. Lord David was ripening. Forty. Tis a marked period. He did not perceive this, and in truth he looked no more than thirty. He considered it more assuming to desire Hosiana than to possess her. He possessed others. He had mistresses. On the other hand, Hosiana had dreams. The Duchess Hosiana had a peculiarity, there we go, peculiarity less rare than it is supposed. One of her eyes was blue and the other black. Her pupils were made for love and hate, for happiness and misery. Night and day were mingled in her look. Her ambition was this, to show herself capable of impossibilities. One day, she said to Swift, you people fancy that you know what scorn is. You people meant the human race. She was a skin-deep papist. Her Catholicism did not exceed the amount necessary for fashion. She would have been a Poussiite in the present day. She wore great dresses of velvet, satin, or more some composed of fifteen or sixteen yards of material, with embroideries of gold and silver, and round her waist many knots of pearls, alternating with other precious stones. She was extravagant in gold lace. Sometimes she wore an embroidered cloth jacket like a bachelor. She rode on a man's saddle, notwithstanding the invention of side saddles, introduced into England in the fourteenth century by Anne, wife of Richard the Second. She watched she washed her face, arms, shoulders, and neck in sugar candy, diluted in white of egg, after the fashion of Castile. There came over her face, after any one had spoken wittily in her presence, a reflective smile of singular grace. She was free from malice and rather good natured than otherwise. End of chapter three. Okay. So, Hosiana is a free bird, and she does not want to get married because then she's going to have all of these expectations, and she won't be able to do whatever she wants. She likes her freedom. She enjoys it. And at the same time, man, why can I not remember names? Not, yeah, Lord David enjoys not getting married, too. Because it, when he gets married, he'll be seen as just being old. And he enjoys his youth. He enjoys just frolicking about and having several mistresses and not having to worry about responsibility or having a wife. So while they are both supposed to marry each other, as soon as they both became of marrying age, they have just been putting it off and putting it off and putting it off until probably they can no longer do that. Okay. Chapter 4. 
the leader of fashion. Hosiana was bored. The fact is so natural as to be scarcely worth mentioning. Lord David held the position of judge in the happy life of London. He was looked up to by the nobility and gentry. Let us register a glory of Lord David's. He was daring enough to wear his own hair. The reaction against the wig was beginning. Just as in 1824, Eugene Daveria was the first to allow his beard to grow, so, in 1702, Prince Devereux was the first to risk wearing his own hair in public, disguised by artful curling. For to risk one's hair was almost to risk one's head. The indignation was universal. Nevertheless, Prince Devereux was Viscount Hereford and a peer of England. He was insulted, and the deed was well worth the insult. In the, in the hottest part of the row, Lord David suddenly appeared without his wig and in his own hair. Such conduct shakes the foundations of society. Lord David was insulted even more than Viscount Hereford. He held his ground. Prince Devereux was the first, Lord David Deary Moore the second. It is sometimes more difficult to be second than first. It requires less genius, but more courage. The first, intoxicated by the novelty, may ignore the danger. The second sees the abyss and rushes into it. Lord David flung himself into the abyss of no longer wearing a wig. Later on, these lords found imitators. Following these two revolutionists, men found sufficient audacity to wear their own hair, and powder was introduced as an extenuating circumstance. In order to establish, before we pass on, an important period of history, we should remark that the first blow in the War of Wigs was really struck by a queen, Christina of Sweden, who wore man's clothes and had appeared in 1680 in her hair of golden brown, powdered and brushed up from her head. She had, besides, says Misson, a slight beard. The Pope, on his part, by the bull of March 1694, had somewhat let down the wig, by taking it from the head of bishops and priests, and in ordering churchmen to let their hair grow. Lord David, then, did not wear a wig, and did wear cowhide boots. Such great things made him a mark for public admiration. There was not a club of which he was not the leader, not a boxing match in which he was not desired as referee. The referee is the arbitrator. He had drawn up the rules of several clubs in high life. He founded several resorts of fashionable society, of which one, the Lady Guinea, was still in existence in Pall Mall in 1772. The Lady Guinea was a club in which all the youth of the peerage congregated. They gained there. The lowest stake allowed was a rouleau of fifty guineas, and there was never less than twenty thousand guineas on the table. By the side of each player was a little stand on which to place his cup of tea and a gilt bowl in which to put the rouleau of guineas. The players, like servants when cleaning knives, wore leather sleeves to save their lace, breastplates of leather to protect their ruffles, shades on their brows to shelter their eyes from the great glare of the lamps, and, to keep their curls in order, broad-brimmed hats covered with flowers. They were masked to, to conceal their excitement, especially when playing the game of Keynes. All, moreover, had their coats turned the wrong way, for luck. Lord David was a member of the Beefsteak Club, the Surly Club, and of the Split Farthing Club, of the Cross Club, the Scratch Penny Club, of the Sealed Knot, a Royalist Club, and of the Martinus Scribblerus, founded by Swift, to take the place of the Rhoda, founded by Milton. Though handsome, he belonged to the Ugly Club. 
This club was dedicated to deformity. The members agreed to fight, not about a beautiful woman, but about an ugly man. The hall of the club was adorned by hideous portraits. <laughs> Over the chimney was Aesop, between two men, each blind of an eye. Cockles and Camoans. Cockles being blind of the left, Camoans of the right eye. So arranged that the two profiles without eyes were turned to each other. The day that the beautiful Mrs. Vissart caught the smallpox, the ugly club toasted her. This club was still in existence in the beginning of the 19th century, and Mirabeau was elected an honorary member. Since the restoration of Charles II, revolutionary clubs had been abolished. The tavern in the little street by Moorfields, where the Cavs Head Club was held, had been pulled down. It was so called because on the 30th of January, the day on which the blood of Charles I flowed on the scaffold, the members had drunk red wine out of the skull of a calf to the health of Cromwell. To the Republican clubs had succeeded monarchical clubs. In them, people amused themselves with decency. There was the Hellfire Club, where they played at being impious. It was a joust of sacrilege. Hell was at auction, there to the highest bitter in blasphemy. There was the Budding Club, so called from its members budding folks with their heads. They found some street porter with a wide chest and a stupid countenance. They offered him and compelled him, if necessary, to accept a pot of porter in return for which he was to allow them to butt him with their heads four times in the chest, and on this they bedded. One day a man, a great brute of a Welshman named Gogangerd, Gogangerd, expired at the third butt. This looked serious. An inquest was held, and the jury returned the following verdict, died of an infliction of the heart caused by excessive drinking. Gogingerd had certainly drunk the contents of the pot of porter. There was the fun club. Go on. Fun is like can't, like humor, a word which is untranslatable. Fun is to farce what pepper is to salt. To get into a house and break a valuable mirror, slash the family portraits, poison the dog. Excuse me, for the cat in the aviary is called cutting a bit of fun. To give bad news which is untrue, whereby people put on mourning by mistake, is fun. It was fun to cut a square hole in the Holbein at, at Hampton Court. Fun would have been proud to have broken the arm of the Venus de of Milo under James the Second, a young million millionaire lord who had during the night set fire to a thatched cottage, a feat which made all London burst with laughter, was the proclaimed king of fun. The poor devils in the cottage were saved in their night clothes. The members of the fun club, all of the highest aristocracy, used to run about London during the hours when the citizens were asleep, pulling the hinges from the shutters, cutting off the pipes of pumps, filling up cisterns, digging up cultivated plots of ground, putting out lamps, sawing through beams which supported houses, breaking the window panes, especially in the poor quarters of town. It was the rich who acted thus towards the poor. For this reason, no complaint was possible. That was the best of the joke. Those manners have not altogether disappeared. In many places in England and in English possessions, at Guernsey, for instance, your house is now and then somewhat damaged during the night, or a fence is broken, or the knocker twisted off your door. If it were poor people who did these things, they would be sent to jail. But they are done by pleasant, young gentlemen. The most fashionable of the clubs was presided over by an emperor who wore a crescent on his forehead and was called the Grand Mohawk. The Mohawk surpassed the fun. 
Do evil for evil's sake was the program. The Mohawk Club had one great objective, to injure. To fulfill this duty, all means were held good. In becoming a Mohawk, the members took an oath to be hurtful, to injure at any price, no matter when, no matter whom, no matter where, was a matter of duty. Every member of the Mohawk Club was bound to possess an accomplishment. One was a dancing master. That is to say, he made the russocks frisk about by prickling the calves of their legs with the point of his sword. Others knew how to make a man sweat. That is to say, a circle of gentlemen with drawn rapiers would surround a poor wretch so that it was impossible for him to turn his back upon someone. The gentleman behind him chastised him for this by a prick of his sword, which made him spring round. Another prick in the back warned him, the fellow, that one of noble blood was behind him, and so on, each one wounding him in his turn. When the man, closed round by the circle of swords and covered with blood, had turned and danced about enough, they ordered their servants to beat him with sticks, to change the course of his ideas. Others hit the lion. That is, they gaily stopped a passenger, broke his nose with a blow of the fist, and then shoved both thumbs into his eyes. If his eyes were gouged out, he was paid for them. Such were, towards the beginnings of the 18th century, the pastimes of the rich idlers of London. The idlers of Paris had theirs, Monsieur de... Chalouet was firing his gun at a citizen standing on his own threshold. In all times, youth has had its amusements. Lord David Deary Muir brought into all these institutions his magnificent and liberal spirit. Just like anyone else, he would happily set fire to a cot of woodwork and thatch, and just scorch those within. But he would rebuild their houses in stone. He insulted two ladies. One was unmarried. He gave her a portion. The other was married. He had her husband appointed chaplain. Cockfighting owed him some praiseworthy improvements. It was marvelous to see Lord David dress a cock for the pit. Cocks lay hold on each other by the feathers as men by the hair. Lord David, therefore, made his as bald as possible. With a pair of scissors, he cut off all the feathers from the tail and from the head to the shoulders, and all those on the neck. So much less for the enemy's beak, he used to say. Then he extended the bird's wings and cut each feather, one after another, to a point, and thus the wings were furnished with darts. So much for the enemy's eyes, he would say. Then he scraped its claws with a penknife, sharpened its nails, fitted it with spurs of sharp steel, spat on its head, spat on its neck, anointed it with spittle as they used to rub oil over athletes, then set it down in the pit, a, red a redoubtable champion exclaiming, That is how to make a cock an eagle, and a bird of the poultry yard a bird of the mountain. Lord David attended prize fights and was their living law. On occasions of great performances, it was he who had the stakes driven in and ropes stretched, and who fixed the numbers, the number of feet for the ring. When he was a second, he followed his man step by step, a bottle in one hand, a sponge in the other, crying out to him to hit hard, suggesting stratagems, advising him as he fought, wiping away the blood, raising him when overthrown, placing him on his knee, putting the mouth of the bottle between his teeth, and from his own mouth filled with water, blowing a fine rain into his eyes and ears, a thing which reanimates even a dying man. If he was referee, he saw that there was no foul play, prevented anyone, whosoever he might be, from assisting the combatants, excepting the seconds declared the man beaten who did not fairly face his opponent, watched that the time between the rounds did not exceed half a minute, prevented butting, 
and declared whoever resorted to it beaten and forbade a man's being hit when down. All this science, however, did not render him a pedant, nor destroy his ease of manner in society. When he was referee, rough, pimple-faced, unshorn friends of either combatant never dared to come to the aid of their failing man, nor, in order to upset the chances of the betting, jumped over the barrier, entered the ring, broke the ropes, pulled down the stakes, and violently interposed in the battle. Lord David was one of the few referees whom they dared not thrash. No one could train like him. The pugilist whose trainer was consented to become was sure to win. Lord David would choose a Hercules, massive as a rock, tall as a tower, and make him his child. The problem was to turn that human rock from a defensive to an offensive state. In this, he excelled. Having once adopted the Cyclops, he never left him. He became his nurse. He measured out his wine, weighed his meat, and counted his hours of sleep. It was he who invented the athlete's admirable rules, afterwards reproduced by Morley. In the mornings, a raw egg and a glass of sherry. At twelve, some slices of a leg of mutton, almost raw, with tea. At four, toast and tea. In the evening, pale ale and toast after which he undressed this man, rubbed him, and put him to bed. In the street he never allowed him to leave his sight, keeping him out of every danger. Runaway horses, the wheels of carriages, drunken soldiers, pretty girls. He watched over his virtue. This maternal solicitude continually brought some new perfection into the pupil's education. He taught him the blow with the fist, which breaks the teeth, and the twist of the thumb with which gouges out the eye. What could be more touching? Thus he was preparing himself for public life, to which he was to be called later on. It is no easy matter to become an accomplished gentleman. Lord David Deary Moore was passionately fond of open-air exhibitions, of shows, of circuses with wild beasts, of the caravans of Montbanks, of clowns, tumblers, merrymen, open-air farces, and the wonders of a fair. The true noble he is who smacks of the people. Therefore it was that Lord David frequented the taverns and low haunts of London and the Cinque Ports. In order to be able at need and, without compromising his rank in the white squadron, to be cheek by jowl with a top man or a calker, he used to wear a sailor's jacket when he went into the slums. For such disguises, his not wearing a wig was convenient, for even under Louis the Fourteenth, the people kept to their hair like the lion to his mane. This gave him great freedom of action. The low people whom Lord David used to meet in the stews, and with whom he mixed, held him in high esteem, without ever dreaming that he was a lord. They called him Tom Jim Jack. Under this name he was famous and very popular amongst the dregs of the people. He played the blackguard in a masterly style. When necessary, he used his fists. This phase of his fashionable life was highly appreciated by Lady Hosiana. End of chapter four. Okay, so... So, okay, so... <laughs> where to begin? We started with just simple things like wearing our own hair and how daring that is. I feel like that might be the least daring thing that has come out of this chapter. That might be a hot take. I don't know. Um, so David, Lord David is in a bunch of clubs. He's very sociable. People know him. He's in all of these different clubs, and they're all terrible. They're all terrible. <laughs> they prey on the poor. They prey on the ugly. They play, prey on the deformed. They prey on, you know, the unaware. 
all of these different things and it is just very clearly privilege versus not <laughs> and because they are privileged and preying on the not they can get away with it whereas they very well know if it was the other way around the poor would definitely have to be prisoned but they're like well we have a title which means we can do whatever we want And in doing that, they burn people's houses down. They surround people and stab them. They poison people's dogs. They do terrible things. I hate it so much. They have like a fight club. I, d I don't like any of this. All right. It's time. Um, We'll pick up wh right where we left off. We are in part two book the first and i think we're about to start chapter five yep chapter five so yes have a good have a good night everyone um we will continue this right where we left off next week um if i don't see you next time i hope to see you very soon as always whether you lurk whether you chat i won a thousand percent appreciate you and i won thousand percent appreciate your support see you all very soon bye